Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest installment in our series of Abbey Wealth Investment Webinars. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Rob Clary from Evelyn Partners in London. Today's topic on artificial intelligence is certainly very topical at the moment, and hopefully Rob will give us some further insights into this mega trend. Before we start, ladies and gentlemen, please ensure that your microphone is on mute so we don't get any background noise. The presentation should last approximately 30 minutes and there will be a question and answer session at the end. There's a Q&A button at the top of your screen. Please use it to submit any questions you want me to ask Rob. So Rob, thanks very much for joining us. Before we start, could you just introduce yourself, what your role is at Evelyn Partners uh, and a bit about your background? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much for having me. So, um, yeah, I'm Rob Clary. I'm an investment strategist at Evelyn Partners. Um, so what that basically involves is three things, really. So first of all, we look at the uh, the short term investment outlook, that's sort of the, the, the six to 18 months time horizon and and try and uh, you know pick assets that we want to be holding over that time period. We also look at the longer term horizon. So that's the strategic horizon. That's the sort of five to 10 year period where we look at some of the longer term trends. Um, and then finally, we do a lot of work around uh, investment research into thematic areas such as artificial intelligence. Um, and that obviously can impact both the short term and the long term as well. So that's briefly at a high level um, what, what we cover in the team. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my background is I joined Evelyn Partners about 18 months ago now. Before that, I worked as a macroeconomist at PwC for around seven years. And we did a lot of work uh, adv advising the government on things like Brexit and COVID uh, and also uh, investment opportunities as, as well. So, so you're to blame? For the COVID response <laughs> and Brexit, yeah, you can you can put the, both of those on me. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for that for that, Rob. So uh, yeah, o over to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, um, yeah, thanks very much. And um, yeah, so for today's session, I just want to talk mainly about investing in the AI revolution, as we've discussed. Um, but before we dive into that, I thought it better, it'd better be helpful just to sort of frame my thinking and, and talk a little bit about some of the other big trends that we see as shaping investment markets over the coming decades. And if you just cast your mind back four or five years and think about everything that's happened, well, I think it's probably fair to say that's been quite a volatile five, four or five years for global markets and the global economy. Obviously, we had the end of the Trump presidency and the polarization that that led to in the US. We had Brexit actually happening here in the UK and the economic shock that that created both in the UK and Europe as well. Um, we've had a pandemic, which you know has highlighted the weaknesses in global value chains and led to rolling lockdowns across the global economy. Last year, we had Russia invade Ukraine. That led to an energy crisis. And, you know, the list goes on and on. So it's been a super volatile period for, for global markets. And, um, you know, I think while all of that has been happening, it's been quite easy to get drawn into the day to day market movements and the headlines and all of the noise that goes with it. But what we want to do is take a step back from all of that and think, what do these events mean for the longer term um, and how can we position for that? And this this work's really come out of that. So. We're trying to think about what do those events mean, but also what are some of the other bigger forces that are shaping global markets uh, over the coming decades? And as you can see in this slide, we've identified four main trends or mega trends, as we call them, that we think are going to be particularly influential over the coming decade and beyond. Um, just going through them one by one. So first of all, um, we think that demographics are going to shift from being a tailwind behind the global economy to more of a headwind. And just to put this into perspective, over the last 40 years, the global economy has gone from four and a half billion to eight billion. So that's a massive increase in just those four decades. And, you know, more people means more workers means more economic growth. So that's been a real boost 
to the global economy. But what we're seeing now is that that's shifting in the other direction. Global fertility rates are very low, so there's fewer babies being born to replace uh, elderly people in society, but also people are living longer as well and retirements are longer. So all of this combines to mean that there's going to be fewer people of working age and more retirees. Um, you know, so that, that begs a number of questions. Who's going to do the work? Who pays for pensions? Um, who's going to provide health care? Um, so as I said, we think that demographics are going to shift from being more of a, a tailwind, which has boosted global growth, to more of a headwind. Um, so our is, second Rob, is that falling in uh, fertility rates across the board? Surely there, there are certain areas that that are and certain areas that, that aren't. Um, so yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not it's not completely uniform. It's not all the same in, in all the global economies. But if you look at the global economy in aggregate as a whole, fertility rates are falling. Now, a lot of that's taken place in the advanced world, but also in places like China as well and um, South Korea. Um, you've got parts of Africa that are still, you know, fertility rates are still pretty high, but they are they're also falling as well. So in aggregate, we think that having gone from being a real tailwind and a real boost, it's going to turn into to more of a headwind. Um, but, you know, that begs the question, there's going to be some areas that grow, continue to grow quite strongly because they've got this, these favourable demographics. There's other areas that uh, are going to face challenges. So. You know, I think that's that's a reason to be a bit more selective around uh, how you invest. So that's the first uh, mega trend. The second one is um, we think that we're in the, a period of changing world order. So if you cast your mind back to the end of the Second World War, coming out of that, there's a whole bunch of new institutions which primarily were led by the West and America that um, put frameworks around the, how, how the global order was governed. We had the World Bank the IMF, uh, NATO, the European Union, all of these things came about following the end of, of the Second World War. And they've remained in place ever since. And really, they've organised world trade uh, and you know global politics and fostered greater economic integration. But what we're seeing increasingly is that this US and Western-led world order is under threat. Obviously, we saw the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year. But, you know, we've also seen China start to exert its dominance across various parts of the global economy. Um, and obviously, there's the risk of the, the sort of uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan as well. So, you know, China is growing uh, in terms of economics and politics, global politics and influence. And it wants to have its say in how the global economy works, essentially. So we think that's going to lead to uh, some problems and potentially reshape how global economies work. Um, so our third uh, hypothesis and megatrend is the bumpy energy transition. And again, the war in Ukraine really brought around an acceleration in terms of uh, the clean energy investment and how important this really is. Um, you know, I think it really highlighted the fact that if you don't have energy, you don't really have an economy if you don't have that energy security. So what we've seen is the US, Europe, UK announce a lot more investment for energy infrastructure and the energy transition. But we think it's going to be a bumpy path to get there because um, you can announce all of this investment, but you have to get the minerals out of the ground in order to build this infrastructure. Um, and what we're seeing is that they're concentrated in some potentially unstable places like the DRC uh, in, in Africa, Congo. 70% uh, of the world's cobalt is, is produced there. They've got a civil war there over access to these cobalt mines. Um, and we're seeing constant, you know, there's concentration across all these minerals in places like China as well. So that's a real risk to the energy transition. You can put all of this money in, um, but you have to get the stuff out of the ground and ensure resilient supply chains uh, to facilitate that as well. So um, that's, that's our thesis there. And then finally, just turn into the technological revolution. So when we set out these mega trends um, this time last year, we thought that we were on the cusp of quite a lot of exciting technology in the pipeline. And actually, what we've seen is that that's played out even quicker than we expected. 
um, with artificial intelligence in particular. Um, but I think technology is also quite interesting because it has the power to offset some of those challenges posed by the other mega trends. So, for example, tech is going to play a critical role in terms of the energy transition, developing new technologies that, that we need. Um, in terms of the changing world order, if we're seeing uh, trade and investment being brought back to the West and the US, well, maybe we're going to need technology to uh, enable some of that in terms of manufacturing robots and things like that. And then in terms of shifting demographics, could technology potentially um, you know, help with some of the healthcare issues that we expect to see with an elderly population? Um, again, could robots come in and potentially help in, in, ter in terms of healthcare provision? We're already, already seeing that in Japan. They're using uh, robots to provide healthcare for elderly populations. So um, tech really has the power, and that's, you know, that's probably the most positive one. Uh, in terms of, of, of the trends, but that really has the power to offset some of those negative impacts from the other mega trends. Um, so as I said, we're going to be speaking a, a little bit more about that today. Um, but before we dive into that, I guess the question around these mega trends is why is this important? Um, and there's a couple of reasons really. So this um, table, I think, explains it quite nicely. It looks at the top 10 largest companies in the world over those last five decades. Um, and I think what it shows is that each decade looks different in terms of the companies, countries, and themes that dominate the top 10. So for example, um, you know, the last decade that was all about US technology, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, et cetera, dominating the top 10. The decade before that, up to 2010, that was all about China taking over the world economy and the companies that would enable that. The decade before was about the technology, media and telecommunications bubble. Um, again, you know, the companies that were heavily involved in that. As you can see, the decade before that, that was all about Japanese companies. So you can see that I think it's eight of the top 10 companies or largest companies in the world were Japanese. And then the decade before that, you can see, was dominated by US oil companies. So each decade has looked different. Things change. Um, these trends and you know, these mega trends do matter to investors, um, both in terms of the economic value that they create, um, but also the, the impact that they have on markets as well. So that's just a bit of an introduction to our megatrend thematic research. You can find a little bit more about that on the website. Um, but for today's session, as I said, I want to speak about artificial intelligence. Um, so I'm going to cover four things. So first of all, just give a bit of background in terms of what's happened so far in the AI space. Secondly, look at the macroeconomic impacts or the potential macroeconomic impacts of AI. Third, talk a little bit about the investment case, so the, the pros and cons. And then finally, just talk about some of the areas that we like best in terms of accessing this AI theme. So when ChatGPT was launched by OpenAI in November last year, they expect it to be this small scale experiment that would help them to build uh, better AI systems. And I think it's fair to say what happened next left them pretty stunned. So in just five days, ChatGPT had been used by a million people globally. Um, for comparison, you can see here in the chart on the left-hand side, it took Netflix about three and a half years to reach that level. And within weeks, it was then being used by more than 100 million people globally. Now, of course, we're seeing that it's been tested inside law firms, uh, financial institutions, governments, schools, um, kids are, are using it to do their homework. Um, and, you know, the introduction success that we've seen in terms of ChatGPT and the impact that it's had has forced other technology firms to bring forward the launch of their products and their own gener generative AI tools. And you can see that in the, the diagram on the right hand side, uh, the table on the right hand side, that gives a few of those examples. Um, and quite rightly, this technology has got a lot of people across the global economy really excited about the potential impacts of AI. And not least economists, and many are forecasting that AI is going to have this transformative impact on the global economy, 
in particular on productivity and the labour market. And a positive impact on productivity would be incredibly welcome. As you can see in the chart on the left, UK productivity trends or productivity growth, that's effectively output per hour per worker. Um, these trends have been incredibly weak in recent decades, and that's held back economic growth. And we've seen quite a similar picture across large parts of the global economy. So the chart on the right, that looks at uh, some academic estimates or the potential impact of AI on annual worker productivity growth. And you can see here that they range from 1.7% to a massive 6.8%. Um, how credible that is, it's hard to tell because it's always difficult to predict how, how these technologies will impact economies. But even if we did get that 1.7%, that would be a pretty material boost to global GDP. You can also see in the table here that global uh, that, um, various uh, consultancies have estimated the impact of uh, AI on GDP. Goldman Sachs have estimated that AI adoption could drive a massive 7% increase in annual economic output. Um, so some pretty impressive figures there. But what about the impact on the jobs market? The same Goldman paper found that two thirds of jobs could potentially be automated by artificial intelligence. So we've had a look at the jobs that are most and least exposed to generative AI, these chat GPT models. And these tables are from a recent academic paper and that used a quantitative methodology to assess which jobs are most and least exposed. So the most exposed you can see in the table on the left um, and the least exposed in the table on the right. Um, and what they found as an overall conclusion is that it's the highly educated, highly paid white collar occupations that could be most exposed to generative AI. And actually, unfortunately for us, it was the finance sector that came out top of that list. Um, so we've looked at some of the roles that we, we thought were sort of quite interesting and relevant for us, um, you know, as a strategist, um, and also we've got investment managers across our business and financial advisors. You can see that uh, some of those roles are quite near the top of those, uh, of those that are most exposed. Um, we also thought it would be helpful to have a look at some of the jobs that we might need to move into once our careers in finance are over. And you can see those in the right. So um, potentially might need to re retrain as a fence erector or professional dancing could be, um, you know, a little bit more appropriate for some of the people that are more flexible. Um, not I don't include myself in that. Um, but as you'd expect, I, ne I never thought I'd hear myself <laughs> saying that that I hope my son grows up to be a bus driver. <laughs> well, everything's changing, but um, yeah, I mean, this is, this just, this does just focus on generative AI. So you, you can see it's those roles that you would be generating text and, and information and things like that. I think the other thing that's quite interesting with this is um, you've got teachers, a lot of teachers in the top 10, but you know, would you want your children being taught by a robot? You know, some of the, the best skills and, and capabilities that teachers have is engaging people and uh, working out how to sort of motivate people and, and how to help them learn best. So um, I imagine the trade unions would have something to say about that as well. So whether or not we lose, uh, you know, as I'm going to speak about in a second, I don't think we're going to lose vast swathes of, of these jobs. But, um, yeah, one, one to bear in mind when um, children are looking at future careers. <laughs> Um, so just coming to the next bit then, so, um, you know, despite all of this scary stuff you see in the headlines and the papers, we have been here before. There's this long history of worry about the impact of technology on jobs. I think the most famous example comes in the early 19th century. There's this group of English textile workers called the Luddites, and they basically destroyed machinery because they thought it was going to take their jobs away. And you know, to this day, that term, the Luddite, is still used uh, to refer to colleagues that are resistant to new ways of working. I'm sure you all work with them in your, your various workplaces. Um, but even if you cast your mind back to the 1990s, people were worried about the impact of the internet on jobs as well. 
But what we can see uh, in this chart here, what we've done here is look at the unemployment rate in uh, the G7 economies over the last 270 years. They're the seven advanced economies in, in the world. And what we can see is that none of those previous uh, technological waves or industrial revolutions led to a big and sustained increase in unemployment. Um, the biggest peak here is, you know, came around the Great Depression in the uh, early uh, two, uh, in 1930. Um, none of those none of those peaks have come about because of technology. So, what what we can say is that after uh, well, what we think is that at least is that after this initial period of disruption, um, history suggests that AI is not going to have this negative impact. It's more likely to create new and more productive jobs in, in different areas. Um, and we looked at another academic paper, which was quite interesting, and it looks at uh, jobs that exist now compared to the 1940s. And it found that 60% of jobs that exist now didn't exist in 1940. Um, you know, so think about some of the jobs in the clean energy space, they probably didn't even exist 20 years ago. So technology just brings about new and, and more productive jobs. That's what history has shown at least. Um, and we have already started to see some new jobs crop up. So some firms are recruiting for prompt engineers, and that's people that feed questions into to chatbots. So maybe that's that's the role that we all need to be thinking about going forward. How, how do you ask a, a AI bot a question? <laughs> um, so just, just to summarize the macroeconomic section here then, this slide just brings together the summary of, of what we've talked about um, in terms of the impact on productivity, GDP, and employment rate. We've also looked at the potential impact on inflation and interest rates as well. Um, and the, the column on the right hand side, that looks at the direction that we expect each uh, variable to move. That's, that's the arrow. And then the color represents whether or not we think this is a good thing for the global economy. So you can see that generally we expect AI to be pretty positive for the global economy. Higher productivity will boost global GDP. We don't know exactly the directional impact on the unemployment rate yet, but we would expect people to move into more productive roles. So we do think that the net impact of uh, AI is positive there. Um, and economic theory implies that interest rates will increase. Um, Depending on your view, int higher interest rates aren't always a, a good thing for the global economy. So we're sort of neutral on that one. But overall, I think the big picture here is that AI could be really good for the global economy. Um, having said that, it, it will take time to feed through. You know, companies are, at the moment are developing their strategies and working out what to do with AI. After that will come the investment. Um, so we're not going to see that immediate big boost in, in productivity or, or growth, it will take um, you know, a bit of time to start feeding through. So turn into section three, which is the investment case for generative AI. Um, as I said earlier, we're still in the early stages of this technology um, and it can be pretty scary or exciting depending, depending on your view to think just how good it can get. And, that's what we've looked at here in this roadmap from global data. This looks at four different stages for generative AI and, and assigns a timeline to that as well. Um, so at the moment, we are in phase one, which is basic. So what does that mean? Well, at the moment, we've got basic translation and conversation, but it's still pretty unreliable. It's not 100% it's not reliable. And actually, as you can see, in terms of its accuracy, it's sort of around 80%, probably slightly less than 80% accuracy at the moment. That obviously um, impacts the amount of tasks it can do. So you can do you know, some content creation, but obviously you need human supervision around that, blog posts and things like that, some initial drafts, but it's not quite the finished product yet, I think it's fair to say. Um, the second phase is um, called the accurate phase, and this is where you get a much higher level of accuracy. That's expected to come in the next one to three years. And at that point, accuracy is expected to be above 95%. And obviously with that, there's a lot more um, uses that you can uh, have for AI. Um, the next phase is knowledgeable. 
and that's expected to take five to 10 years. That's where it will actually have knowledge of the world, including apparently some common sense and some planning capabilities. Um, and at that point, it can create content with no human supervision um, and you know, it's a lot more uh, reliable and accurate. So you can use it for, again, a, a much wider range of tasks and activities. And then finally, phase four, uh, conscious phase, that's potentially when things get a little bit scary and it has 100% accuracy and human level uh, translation and knowledge and, and conversation and understanding, et cetera. Now, whether we get there or not, um, experts are quite divided at the moment. Um, it's not necessarily a given that we do get there, um, but this is you know, when it could have vast uh, application across the global economy, but also that's when some of the risks come into play as well. If there's no sort of human supervision, then um, who knows what AI will get up to. But at, that, at this point, it seems quite a long way off from that. So we'll maybe worry about that a bit nearer the time. Rob, in your um, opinion, will, will, will that improvement come through human intervention or will that be through self-learning? Yeah, so it's 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 going to be about um, human intervention still. So there's a you know a lot of development work that needs to get to that that phase. Um, as I said, who knows if we get there? People are pretty divided at the moment. Some people think that it's you know maybe closer than ten years away, whereas other people have said it's it's just not a, a reasonable um, objective to get, or it's not it's not feasible to get to that. So um, yeah, who knows? It's it's quite divided at the moment. Um, okay, so in terms of how investors can access AI um, and invest in the theme, um, we've been sort of thinking about it through two different lenses. So first of all, you can think about the sectors or businesses that can benefit from AI and these efficiency gains. You can see some of those in the table on the left hand side. Um, I think some of the most exciting use cases come from the healthcare sector. I don't know if anyone saw the article on the BBC a couple of weeks, but this uh, it basically said that scientists have been using AI to discover um, a new antibiotic that can kill deadly species of um, superbugs. So there's a there's a lot of use in in healthcare, and actually that's you know massive application and could be a real uh, game changer for the healthcare industry. But obviously there's applications across other areas, customer services. I'm sure you've all been frustrated at some point. Uh, speaking to chatbots uh, with, with your, you know, with your bank or other uh, custom service industries as well. Um, so, so that's that's one element. You can invest in, in in sectors that can benefit from these efficiency gains. Some are sort of more applicable to some sectors than others. Um, the other the other angle that we're looking at is um, what we're calling the generative AI leaders. Um, that's the companies that are involved in developing the chatbots, so the likes of Google and, and Meta as well, but also the companies that are developing the chips that are needed to power artificial intelligence. And AI models, they need a massive amount of computing power, both to train the models and generate the output as well. Um, and that can't be done um, using just one chip or semi semiconductor. Um, you need you know a massive amounts to to do this. So what that means is through this decade and beyond, as AI proliferates, there's going to be this structural demand for semiconductor firms and and chip producers and designers. Um, and that's a, another good way of of accessing this theme. So what we've done here is we what we want to do is track the performance of generative AI. So we've created this custom, Evelyn AI Index. Um, it's based on the companies that we have under coverage here at Evelyn. So across the firm, we've got um, quite a lot of equity analysts that cover all the different sectors. And from each of those sectors, we've picked out uh, the companies that are most heavily involved in artificial intelligence. We've put them into a, an index and we've looked at how that index performs against the broader US stock market. Um, and what you can see here is that since ChatGPT was launched in November of last year, um, the Evelyn AI port portfolio has significantly outperformed the broader stock market. Um, you know, before that, it was sort of underperforming as the impact of higher interest rates came through. 
and uh, you know hit the returns on some of those technology stocks. But since ChatGPT Ch was launched um, in November, as I said, it's, it's massively outperformed the rest of the stock market. Um, and that just shows how excited investors are about the steam and the potential impact that it can have. Um, and a key reason why investors are excited by artificial intelligence is clearly about the potential revenues that it can generate. So as you can see in the chart on the left here, this looks at data um, from global data, and they've forecasted the total AI market, which um, comprises software, uh, hardware, which is where the semiconductors fit in, and um, services as well. And they think it's gonna be worth around 400 billion in 2030, and it's expected to grow at a 21% annual growth rate from this year. So um, pretty significant growth through this decade. Um, and then the chart on the, on the right hand side that looks at the breakdown of specialist AI applications. So that's the, uh, the red area from the chart on the left. Um, and they've broken it, it down into various market categories. So um, conversational platforms, which is red, that's the chat GPT models and um, computer vision, that's the green area. Um, and that actually involves the extraction of information from visual data and then horizontal applications as well. That's the blue area. Um, and there the apps that embed that are embedded with with AI features. So uh, image recognition or natural language processing. So you can see that all three of those segments are expected to grow pretty strongly and that application market is expected to be worth um, about 150 billion in 2030 um, and it's currently worth about 30 billion now so um, pretty significant revenue growth in that section as well. Um, but of course one of the risks to this AI theme is valuations and as I said um, investors have got quite excited about this theme already and they've uh, the stocks have already moved uh, a reasonable amount. The table here on the left looks at some of the valuation metrics of the Evelyn AI basket today. And what we want to do here was just to see how stretched are those valuations compared to previous bubbles or you know, IT bubbles that we've seen in the past. So we looked at the valuation compared to the start of 2022, as well as the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s. Um, so you can see that in terms of the, the price to earnings ratio, the current valuation is lower than, than both of those uh, previous events. Um, you can also see in the price to cash flow measure that the current period um, compares quite favorably as well to, to both of those events. Um, but I would say that the price to earnings ratio of 37 uh, times at the moment, um, that is still pretty expensive. That does mean that these companies have to deliver on those growth expectations in the coming years, in the coming years as well. Um, the other risk to this as well is that you can see in the chart on the right hand side that this AI basket, the Evelyn AI basket, as you'd expect, is more volatile than the broader US market. And um, you know that's because these, you know, some of these companies are are newer companies. It's a new technology. No one quite knows how it's going to, to pan out. So. That's just another thing that you'd have to consider before investing in these types of stocks. Um, so turning to the investment strategy, which is, is the final bit, and just coming back to the generative AI leaders that I spoke about a little bit earlier, as I said, there's, there's a couple of ways to play this theme, but our favored route is via the global semiconductor sector. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. So first of all, it's quite difficult to know which company is going to win the race to develop this leading chatbot, um, or if in fact there will be a winner. And companies are spending you know, lots of money on this at the moment. Um, um, so it's quite hard to see who's going to win that race and it's gonna to continue to be competitive. But secondly, with this type of development, we think it's often um, more rewarding and more profitable to invest in the picks and shovels rather than the gold rush. So. In this case, um, with all this volume of data for AI to interpret, interpret as that continues to grow exponentially, that's going to increase demand for the AI optimized chips that semiconductor firms are building, uh, particularly those from NVIDIA, 
Um, and there's a few other firms in this space as well. So we think there's going to be structural demand as AI proliferates for the global semiconductor sector. So just turn into the investment conclusions then. Um, we think that strategically, so that's the sort of five to 10 year time horizon that I spoke about earlier. We think there's a, a strong case to invest in some of these AI leaders and some of the sectors that are going to benefit. Um, we still think it's important to be careful of elevated valuations. Those are some of the stocks that we've, we've looked at have potentially gone a little bit too far in terms of the price movement. Um, others still look fairly reasonable. So it's important to, to be quite selective around how you pick those stocks. Um, there could also be a better entry point uh, than now, uh, particularly if the global economy starts to slow in the second half of this year, that might mean that you can pick up these, some of these companies a little bit cheaper. Um, we, at this stage, we favor some of the larger cap names in the market. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. So they've got a lot more access to data. Um, they've got the internal teams and capabilities to create value from this data. And they've also got the deepest pockets to invest. So, you know, there's a lot of exciting AI startups out there, but um, we think at this stage, we would prefer to be with some of those larger companies that have that proven track record. Um, as I said before, it's hard to know who's going to win the generative AI race. Um, uh, there's a lot of money going into the chatbots and there's a lot of competition there. So we prefer to invest in the picks and shovels, as we're calling it. That's the global semiconductor sector. And as with those other mega trends that I spoke about a little bit earlier, um, what we want to be doing is investing in the companies that have these tailwinds created by the mega trends and that have the tailwinds behind them and avoiding the companies that could potentially face headwinds and you know, potentially could face pretty significant risk going forward from, from things like this, from technology or some of those other trends that we spoke about. Um, so that's it from me for now. Um, do have a look at our research if you want to, to find out a little bit more about the mega trends. Um, and I'm gonna pause there and, and see if there's any questions and, and thanks for listening. So, so Rob, first things, thanks very much. Really interesting, if 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 not a little terrifying, as <laughs> as as well. Um, I guess first question, you know, directly to you, I, how are Evelyn Partners using AI at the moment? Um, yeah, so we are experimenting and trying to work out how how best to use it. As I said earlier, in terms of like. Content creation is not that great at the moment, so it's not going to save me um, loads of time writing research notes because uh, for anyone that's used it, I'm sure you've experienced this as well. Some of the stuff it does come up with is potentially not that relevant or a little bit waffly. So um, I think if you're doing more sort of generic things that don't need necessarily that expert insight, then some of the content creation is okay. Um, the other area that we're we're looking at in terms of the strategy team is we do um, quite a bit of coding work um, in in areas like Python. So um, it's actually pretty powerful in that space. So it looks at all the coding that's ever been done and all of the you know all of that good work, and then it pulls in um, that from the internet. So what we're finding is it's it's pretty powerful in terms of being able to or helping us to, to write code um, for investment research. So that's. That's a really good use at the moment. Um, and then the other area that our investment managers have been using it as well. I, I spoke to one the other day and he was saying that um, as an equity analyst, he would go and sit on an earnings call for a company for two or three hours. And the, you know, the managers would drone on and uh, you know speak about all sorts of things. But he's instead been using AI to analyze the, the earnings call. So instead of sitting there for three hours, he can um, ask AI to summarize or ask ChatGPT to summarize the key points in certain areas that he's interested in from the earnings call um, in, in a couple of minutes. So um, he's pretty, you know, he's, he's pretty amazed at how, how good it is in that sense. So they're just a couple of examples of how we use it. Obviously, we're going to keep keep giving it a go in, in different areas and keep exploring. But, um, you know, at the moment, it's 80% accurate once it gets a, a little bit more accurate, then um, it's pretty scary how many applications it, it will have. And then maybe we need to start thinking about uh, those jobs as fence erectors and professional dancers.
So do, do you see a point in time in which AI would be actually picking the stocks itself for a for a portfolio? Um, it's hard to see that now just because of the accuracy issues and um, yeah, I don't think you get very much success at the moment just because it doesn't have that. It doesn't necessarily know what to look at. Um, you know, potentially when it gets to that sort of 99, 10%, or, sorry, 100% accuracy, then maybe it will, maybe that will be a use that we can look at. But I, at the moment, it seems um, quite a long way from being able to, to do that at the moment. Is, is there any kind of an industry standard or, or regulatory board overlooking all this, or, or, or is it just a free for all at the moment? Um, there's not, I don't know how much there's been done from a regulatory perspective. I know that there's work being done um, at the, the overall government level um, to try and work out what, what we do with AI and, and um, the Conservative government are looking into that at the moment. The European Commission are also doing um, a lot of work around regulating AI as well. Um, but I think for us as a firm, there's, you know, internally there's there's work going on to, to work out, well, how, how can we use it best and what do we need to be careful of and what are the risks, et cetera. So I think across the financial industry, a lot of firms are undertaking that work, but um, we're still waiting for some sort of regulatory guidance to say uh, what you can and, and can't do at the moment. I think, I think you're on mute maybe, Ian. Apologies. There Given is. the world conflicts, questions come in. Given the world conflicts and China's global positioning, where location-wise would you be investing with regard to chip technology? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because um, you've got obviously the world leaders uh, or the world leader is, is TSMC, which is in Taiwan. But obviously, there's significant geopolitical risk around that with with China. Um, there's a massive amount of investment taking place in the US and Europe to try and bring back that um, chip capacity uh, to those economies. Um, so I think, as always with these things, it's really hard to know who's going to be the winner in 10 years time. I think um, the way that we prefer to access this is a, 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 you know via a diversified portfolio rather than just putting all your bets into one stock. Um, there's a semiconductor index, which actually comprises um, a whole bunch of different companies in, involved in this space that we we quite like and we think is quite interesting. Um, and I think over time we're sort of building a position in that because, um, you know, there's, there's definitely risks to the sector as well. You've got the geopolitical risks hanging over it. Um, but this is, you know, the, you know, some people said that semi semiconductor chips are the new oil. Um, they're going to be absolutely vital to the global economy. Um, they are now, but even more so going forward. So it's it's really important to have uh, allocation to those kind of companies. A, a previous question that came in, someone challenged one of your your, your data on which jobs are at risk and, and not at risk. Um, Surely bus drivers and pilots are prime AI targets with self-driving buses and self-flying planes. Now, obviously, personally, I'd probably get on a self-driving bus, but uh, at what stage do you think we, we would see self-flying planes and, and would you ever personally get on one? <laughs> that is a quite a scary prospect, isn't it? So, yeah, so as I said, these are these are the occupations that are most exposed to generative AI, which is what I've been talking about today, which is the, the sort of chat GPT models that have gained a lot of exposure in recent months uh, and from well over the last year, really. Um, but there are other forms of AI. So as the, as the um, listener said, um, you know, that that's the, those roles, bus drivers are, are very, you know, very exposed and actually it's quite interesting because the technology here in London, we're seeing all the strikes at the moment for the, the rail network and underground, et cetera. We've already got the technology to automate all of those jobs, but this is where the technology sort of butts up against policy and um, you know the structure of economies because the unions have basically prevented, prevented that happening. So while these jobs, while certain jobs are exposed or not exposed, actually, 
whether or not jobs can be replaced is a completely different question as i said with with the teachers as well like are the unions going to allow that and would would parents allow that so um you know take this with a pinch of salt it's, it's a quantitative approach that looks at those jobs that are most and least exposed to generative ai so those ai bots that are generating content like chat gpt um so there's as i said there's other forms as well but um that's a good point were you aware of the advances coming on in in ai or was the the launch of chat gpt you know a shock to you as it, it was to me for example um well we we have been we follow technology quite closely um we 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 set these mega trends out um this time last year and one of our big themes was technological revolution because we thought there was a lot of exciting technology in the in the pipeline whether that was ai quantum computing the clean energy technology that's that's coming um through so we thought that there was a lot happening in the tech, tech space that we were quite excited with um we'd seen these sort of generative models uh, and read about them and, and seen them tested but it wasn't like most people it wasn't until it was launched and you actually got to play with it that you were like wow this is um pretty powerful so we, we thought that well, we were on the verge of some pretty significant changes. I think we've been surprised by how quickly it's it's happened and how quickly it, it took off. And as I said at the start, even OpenAI, which is the company that developed ChatGPT, they were massively surprised at how quickly it, it took off. They were just using it as a trial to to try and see you know how people interacted with it and and how it worked. And um, they were amazed how quickly it took off. So. I think it's you know it's probably fair to say that most people have been even in the industry have been surprised by how quickly um, it's had an impact. And obviously, once ChatGPT was launched, everyone else rushed to to launch theirs. How how do they compare against each other um, in terms of accuracy? I mean, ChatGPT stole the march and is sort of the one most people probably know about. Um, but are they all much the same? Are there, is, is there a leader? Um, I would probably say that ChatGPT is still the market leader. Um, they've sort of got this first mover advantage by getting it out there, getting people using it and, um, you know, generating more data and more understanding by the fact that a lot more people are, are using that as well. I think historically Google has been a real leader in AI. So that's probably the other one that's, um, the main competition um, and yeah I think I think it's probably fair to say that it's track GPT is still still the market leader a question it were well, a question stroke comment from uh, uh, Nick as an ex-pilot I was always told you can teach monkeys brackets AI to fly but you can't teach airmanship so perhaps a, a major stepping stone in AI capacity uh, is to undertake the decisions whilst making decision making required to to fly. So yeah, in, in, interesting, interesting yeah, so, point. Well, maybe maybe we're maybe that's in this phase four that we were talking about earlier, where um, you know AI has human level intelligence and it can do things and make independent decisions. But as I said, we don't know if we're going to get to that that level or, or not. So um, yeah, interesting yes. times. I'm not uh, coming back to your question. Would I get on on a flight? Well, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yes. Um, but they, I think they're, they're trialing they're trialing um, a self driving uh, bus in in Scotland at the moment. I think it's it's one of the first trials. So um, interested to see see how that goes. Maybe I'll I'll wait a few years before getting on it. Yes. A question here from John: If there is little regulation. Could AI be manipulated to drive investments in, in one particular direction, then retract, causing a market crash? Are there any particular buffers in place to prevent this happening? Yeah, that's that's an interesting um, interesting idea, isn't it? Because we've seen in the past, like computer trading systems have led to sort of flash crashes in global markets. Um, so yeah, the, I, I definitely say that there's there is a risk of that and I don't. I don't think. I mean, I don't sit in the regulation team. I don't think there's any. There's been any sort of industry-wide regulation yet that I know of. But 
Um, it's still fairly early days, so I imagine that the regulators are scrambling around working out what to do and, and how to, to prevent something like that. So regulations come in. It's, <clears throat> it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, there's a risk that you could potentially over, over-regulate AI and impact its ability to transform businesses in the global economy. The Americans are, you know, historically um, less in favour of regulation and, and uh, than the Europeans. And I know that the Europeans have quite a strict AI act coming up. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that, how that pans out, whether that holds the European AI sector back or not. But um, yeah, I think like everyone, regulators are still working out what this what this really means and how to regulate it effectively. Are most of these AI companies we've talked about today US-based? Yeah, that's a fair fair assessment. So um, I think there's there's good like expertise on AI in in Europe in terms of like universities and think tanks and things like that. Um, but all the companies really, so all the big companies are, are based in the US. So. Um, in the Silicon Valley and those sorts of areas. So the US is is the leader. There's also a lot happening in China as well. So China's the other big competitor to the US. Um, and, you know, again, that's just another aspect of that competition between the US and China. And interesting to see how, how that pans out. Are, are they behind the curve or are they just not necessarily released what they're working on? Um, well, the US, the US is still dominant. Um, in terms of the AI, AI space, I think China's probably catching up quite quickly. Um, but yeah, the US is, is still the market leader, but both in terms of like this type of commercial generative AI, but also in terms of the AI that's used in um, the military, for example. So um, it's it's still seen as as the market leader. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. I think I think on that that note, once again, really thanks very much for your time. Really, really interesting topic, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, if uh, after some thought, this throws up other questions, please do get in touch with your Abbey Wealth advisor. Um, I'm sure we can fire any additional questions to Rob after the event. So once again, Rob, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attendance.